And no, thank you. Um, <laughs> Thanks everyone for being here. Um, we are gonna be sitting here talking about federal loan repayments restarting. Um, I know that it's been a complicated process for so many and we're here as a support system for you as a cent. Before we get started, just a couple of notes. One, we are recording this presentation. So we will be sharing it afterwards through a couple of different resources. So you will have access to this following this conversation. We will have opportunities for Q&A both in the chat and in the Q&A section in the, Zoom, in the Zoom. So please drop your questions in there. We want to be there as a resource for you uh, to help you through this time. We know that there's this is a sensitive topic. There's a ton of questions. There's a lot of complexity here. We're not going to be able to address everyone's questions, but please put them in there because what it will do is it will give us the guidance of additional webinars, additional blog posts, additional email resources, and things that we can do to continue to support you. But please put them in there. We've got team members standing by um, to make sure that we can address as much as possible. And then number three, we have a ton of post-event resources that we'll be emailing out and are also available with the recording through the QR code. There's QR codes throughout for additional resources, um, so stay tuned. I'm excited to introduce you to some of my esteemed colleagues. First, my name is Ali Danziger. I'm the SVP and GM of Ascent Up. It's a resource that's available to all Ascent borrowers to help support you in every part of the navigation between your education and your employment. I'll talk about it in a little bit. And so first, let me introduce Erin Swenson. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. I'm Erin Swenson, financial wellness coach with the Ascent Up program um, at Ascent Funding. And I've been um, a coach in higher ed and with skills-based programs for the past decade. I support students um, across the board with academic career financial coaching and finances is a key topic that comes up, um, especially around financial aid, loan repayment, financial wellness. So my goal and what I enjoy doing is really supporting people and bridging that gap between knowledge and skills to make the right decisions for them um, to support their financial wellness. So uh, yeah, happy to be here. And Mike. Great. Hi, uh, Michael Middleton. I'm the SVP and general manager of the college lending business here at Ascent. I've uh, been in the higher education finance space for more than 25 years, both in federal uh, student lending as well as private student lending, uh, helping students facilitate their dreams by being able to afford to pay for school. Great. We would love to hear from all of you as well. So I'm going to launch a poll here and feel free to answer. We'd love to hear from you of where you are. Um, and feel free to drop in the chat where you're coming from. But I'll give us a second to just participate in this poll. We want to know what are you most worried about right now and thinking about with federal loan repayments restarting. Give us a few seconds. First option is choosing the right repayment plan for my unique situation the complexity of everything to follow between the loan servicer, studentaid.gov, email updates, et cetera, or the inability to make payments and reincorporate all of this into your budgets. Thank you all for, for taking the time to fill this out. Um, just to share with everyone who you're listening to, it's a pretty good breakdown. Um, a lot of people are just questioning how to choose the right repayment plan for their unique situation. All of these, this is what we're talking about here today. So let us dive right in. Mike, I'll hand it over to you. Great. Yeah. So uh, it's not um, unusual that we have a lot of questions about uh, about repayment as, as there have been a lot of changes that have happened in this space over the past couple of years. So uh, a little walk down memory lane. We won't get into too many de details about it, but if we go back to March of 2020 with COVID-19 pandemic, uh, pause. There was a pause on student loan payments um, that affected everyone, and and interest rates went to zero, and 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 people have have kind of been on this, you know, waiting until something happens. And and over time, the the government has done a lot of different things to try to alleviate the burden for students um, uh, as they're about to re-enter repayment or or provide more opportunities for loan forgiveness. Um, as we've seen in the past, you know, six or 12 months, a lot of things have changed uh, as it relates to 
the Supreme Court and and uh, denying the the loan to forgiveness um, uh, that had passed previously, and and a re, uh, rebound by the the Biden administration to implement a few more changes. But here we are um, entering repayment for for several borrowers is coming up here this month in October. Uh, interest started accruing last month, and and you're all here wondering. Hey, what, what do I do now that I'm supposed to enter repayment again? What are my options? And, and that's what we're really here to talk about today. And so the good news is the government has done quite a bit, a really good job of trying to help consumers and, and borrowers understand how to navigate um, the repayment options. And really the best resource that's out there is, is studentaid.gov, which is, is run by the Department of Education. Um, and, and we have QR codes, as, as Ali has mentioned, uh, throughout this presentation to help you uh, navigate and find your way to, to some of these resources that are out there. So studentaid.gov um, and your loan services website are probably the two biggest resources that we would point you to in, in helping you determine what's the best option for you. So we're gonna walk through pretty quickly, uh, uh, kind of briefly, what, what does it look like as you go through the studentaid.gov uh, website? Um, so the first thing to, to, to understand is, is who is your loan servicer? And for some of you, you might not know, well, what is a loan servicer? Uh, the loan servicer is the entity that is, is uh, in charge of collecting payments, sending your bill, collecting your payments for you uh, on behalf of the government. So um, the government has a handful of, of loan servicers and and those servicers change. For example, if you were to apply for a PSLF, your loans would be transferred to a servicer called Mohila. There are a handful of other services that are out there that work on behalf of the government. So the best thing to do is to log in to studentaid.gov and, and you can access and find out who is a servicer on your loan so you can contact them and, and, and find out more information about your specific loan uh, product. Okay, so once you're on uh, your FSA your student aid dashboard, um, you can click on pay uh, on service website to do payment amounts. Um, you may have to log on to that website to, uh, to be able to access information, but at least there you can find out like what are your, your repayment obligations um, for, for your loans and know that if you have more than uh, one loan that you, you may have more than one servicer, it should be all at one, but you may have more than one um, uh, depending on your situation. Okay, so here's one of the questions that came up uh, at, the, at the outset with the poll is, is what's the right pay, uh, payment plan for you? And this is really probably one of the, the, the nicest features of, of the website is, is this loan simulator uh, um, tool that's on the studentaid.gov website. Um, you click on it and really, it's, got, it's, it's kind of self-explanatory in a sense of, of being able to navigate through it. They're very intuitive questions that asks you about your particular situation uh, that ultimately will guide you to what is the best repayment option for you. We'll talk briefly in a moment about what some of the different repayment options are, um, what some of the, um, uh, the income-driven repayment plans that are available to you. And, and it is confusing and it is applicable to certain consumers depending on when they took out their loans. Um, and, and this is a tool that does a really, really great job of helping you navigate to the right answer for you uh, based on your individual situation. Erin, you've gone through this process. Can you share a little bit of your experience? Definitely. Yeah, I'm right alongside many of you in this repayment journey. Um, so it's it actually is very user friendly if you haven't gone through the steps that Mike just went through. Um, the screenshots, once you log in to studentaid.gov, it will take you to your dashboard. And it's very clear what your loans are, what your balance is. And on the right-hand side, it will show your loan servicer with a button to go directly to them. And that's where you can see your payment. Um, and I, I did get um, an email from my servicer on September 30th, and my first payment is due October 22nd. So they are honoring that 21-day notice that is on studentaid.gov. Um, so these are definitely pretty easy steps to navigate if you are feeling overwhelmed. Um, it took me about less than 10 minutes to go through these steps and really get a sense of what my options were and what my payment was. Great. Thanks for sharing. Mm -hmm. Mike, hand it back over to you. 
<laughs> like we move to the next slide. There we go. Okay. So, all right. So, um, so, so one of the things that comes up a lot right now is, is, uh, and uh, what are my forgiveness options? Because there have been some changes as it relates to, um, like a one-time payment uh, counter adjustment. What does that really mean? How does it apply? And really those, uh, those adjustments really apply to two types of um, forgiveness options, generally speaking, the public service loan forgiveness option and the income driven repayment plan, which are kind of the two most prominent um, kind of repayment plans that, uh, that people are interested in, in learning to, uh, more about. Um, it's also important to know that there are other loan discharge options available to consumers that take out uh, federally, uh, federally guaranteed student loans or, or loans to the direct loan program. Uh, those are mentioned on the slide. So there's teacher loan forgiveness, some federal Perkins loan cancellation programs, et cetera. Um, but really, we're going to focus um, today's conversation um, about PSLF and, and IDR and kind of uh, what some of those things are. Uh, and I think really click down even more so on the IDR plans, um, even more so than PSLF. So when you're choosing your repayment plans, you uh, you might go to the website, to the studentaid.gov website and see that there's a whole lot of information out there. And, and um, some of it's alphabet soup and some of it is, you know, a lot of words that look and sound the same. And I think the, be the easiest way to separate the two is to understand that there are basic repayment plans and then there are what are called income driven repayment plans. So when you take out your loan originally, um, there are some basic payment plans that are available to you. It's really the standard repayment plan and the graduated repayment plan are the kind of the primary ones that are that are made available to you. And then if you have more than $30,000 in uh, total student loan debt, you can uh, apply for an extended repayment uh, plan. And that gives you a, a repayment term of uh, up to 25 years instead of the standard 10 years that you get with most uh, student loan products uh, under the government plan, uh, programs. Um, and of course, if you were to consolidate your loan, you can have a repayment plan that's up to 30 years, depending on the, the loan balance uh, of, of your loan. Um, but ultimately, it's just important to know, like you generally, you know, enter that standard repayment plan as a 10 year repayment term where your payments are just going to retire that debt obligation over the 10 years. A graduated repayment plan is designed for you to have lower payments that are somewhat close to interest only when you first enter repayment. And then they gradually step up over time and still would be repaid over that 10 year uh, uh, repayment period. Um, no payment is gonna be more than three times greater than the other one. So it's designed to you know, increase as hopefully your income increases over time, but doesn't create too much of a burden for you to have to repay it within the standard repayment period. Excuse me. Um, and then like we, we spoke briefly about the extended repayment plan. You can move forward to the next slide. Before I do, quick question, uh, something that came up in the chat is, do you, when you are a student and you're actively in school, what are your uh, requirements at that time? Yeah, I mean, so uh, you can you can choose to make payments or not, but um, uh, most students uh, have a deferred repayment option, right? So you are not required to make payments on your loan while you are enrolled at least half time in school and during the grace period that um, that occurs after you separate from school. Um, depending on the type of loan you have, whether it's a subsidized loan or an unsubsidized loan. In the case of a subsidized loan, the government is subsidizing the interest uh, portion, so you don't have any interest that accrues. Uh, in an unsubsidized loan, interest does accrue, so that means that um, you know interest is just counting in the background, and then it gets added to the loan once you get out of school. For the past you know couple of years, we've had this you know wonderful uh, period of time where where there has been no interest charge. So it's basically been the same thing as, as being subsidized uh, for the uh, during the COVID uh, relief period. That's that's all kind of come to an end for the unsubsidized portion of, of loans. So interest is going to start accruing again and, and ultimately that would be capitalized, which means added back to the principal balance of the loan once they enter repayment. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, so what are some of the income-driven plans or IDRs as, as you might uh, hear them? And, and there are several of them that are available um, to, to borrowers and, and um, I won't go too much into the very nitty gritty details of each of those. It's just important to know that there's been kind of, I would say an evolution of IDR plans over time. And the most recent version of this IDR is the SAVE plan, which is saving on a value education. And Aaron's gonna speak briefly about uh, some of the components of that uh, in, a, in a minute or two. Um, 
but that is something that has just been recently adjusted from what was formerly called the repay plan. Um, all of the uh, income-driven repayment plans are designed to um, make payments more affordable to the borrower and payments um, are going to generally be based on a percentage of discretionary income and discretionary income is calculated differently depending on what that payment plan is. Um, and, and in most cases, it's based on um, the, federal the federal poverty line for your family situation, whether you are a, an individual, if you are dependent, if you have dependents, if you're married, et cetera, et cetera. The good news is, again, all this information in terms of how to get to the right answer is going to be in, on the website, going through the loan simulator, makes it very easy for you in terms of understanding what do I qualify for? What is the payment amount that I would be eligible for? What um, loan forgiveness options really uh, um, do I qualify for uh, and what's ultimately the best repayment option for me to select? Another question that came through, um, so so much right now is about picking the right re repayment plan for you in the moment that you are today. What if you change that? What if you decide, you know, two years in, you want to change to a different plan? How does that work and what are the pros and cons to that, if, if any? Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's certainly pros and cons to, to, those, to those questions. And I think, uh, again, Checking with uh, checking with your servicer, checking uh, on the website, and 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 researching the the plans as much as you can to identify like what are the implications of of changing. Right, um, that's the best thing to do. Um, uh, advocate for yourself on that. Great. So as Mike mentioned, there's a lot of self advocating and learning what else is out there, understanding all the resources, all of these different QR codes that have been shared, uh, and it's a lot. And so that's why we have this webinar tonight and why we are going to continue sharing additional resources with you. All Ascent borrowers have access to a program called Ascent Up that was previously called uh, Ascent Success, Student Success, uh, and the Learn tab of our app. We have tons of resources dozens of hours worth of content um, that we are sharing with students, with job seekers, and with early career professionals that are early to their profession and navigating those various complexities. And so we have this as a resource for you. Please take advantage of it. Erin's one of our lead coaches within the program and has helped to create a lot of the content that's in here. And so now I'll pass it over to her to, to answer just some of the questions that you may be having that are outside of the logistics of what we do, but how does this actually apply to you? Erin. Perfect. Thank you. If you can go to the next slide, Allie. <laughs> Um, awesome. So I'll just be going through what's top of mind for many people is just how do I bring this back into, how do I bring um, budgeting for my repayment back into my budget after three years, if you haven't been, been contributing? Um, I'll go through scenarios in terms of you know, strategies with budgeting, what to do if you are facing financial hardship, what are your options, as well as I'm going to talk about some different statuses, such as what if I'm in default with my student loans, and what if I'm going through bankruptcy. So we'll cover those in the next five minutes. So um, the step I took, and if you do have wiggle room, is really do a budget refresh. It was very eye-opening. I'm pretty good at tracking my expenses. But in, in just going through monthly statements, you do kind of see where some of your wants are and needs, and you're able to identify, okay, where can I cut back? So I went through this when I saw my payment, because I do want to reduce it by at least $75 if I can. Um, so I'm using the 50, 30, 20 budgeting technique. And I wanted to share that because it's it's a simple approach to budgeting and it's structured. So if you're new to budgeting or just want a different approach, essentially what you do is take your monthly income after taxes and then 50% of that goes to needs. So that's like what you need, your transportation, housing, utilities, childcare, 30% goes to wants and 20% towards debt and savings. And what's great about this is you can tweak the percentages to meet your financial goals. So some like quick tip strategies with reducing expenses, um, review the apps you're paying for, streaming subscriptions. Um, I went through my iPhone and they have a subscription um, tab and I was paying for an app that I didn't 
need anymore. And I didn't know I was paying like $10 a month. So that was a nice, nice um, cut to my expenses there. And then groceries, I think oftentimes not planning or going to a store that's more expensive, being able to buy off brand, use coupons. There's different strategies. And that's from a coaching perspective. Like what can we do that's in our control? Because a lot of this might feel out of control and out of reach as you're approaching repayment. So it's kind of empowering just to see what you can do and what steps you can take. And then if you are a student, there are student discounts. And then also in terms of reducing any impulsive purchasing, try a weekly allowance, you know, just pick, pick a number that's going to help your budget and see if it works, see if it creates some more mindfulness and discipline. All right. So I'm sure many of you might be feeling like, you know, I'm, maybe barely getting by or you're in a tough financial situation. Um, everyone on this call is in, you know, facing different economic situations. So if you can't afford to make a payment, there's two options. Number one is the save plan, which I'm sure you've been seeing in the news or getting emails about. Mike um, talked about a little bit, but this really is the new income driven repayment plan that offers the lowest monthly payments. Um, it's available to most borrowers, so I do encourage you to use the QR code. It has a great chart that shows income, number of dependents, and it's a nice, it, it gives you a breakdown of where you might fall in terms of repayment with SAVE. And if you were on the repay plan before um, we went into pause, you'll automatically move into SAVE. So there's no action you have to take. And then what happens with SAVE is they're looking at your income and family size, not the balance of your student loans. Um, and then if you really aren't, like if you're in that position of not being able to pay, there is the on-ramp program and this was created. It started October one, it's going through next, uh, September, 2024. So this essentially protects borrowers from not being reported for missing payments. You won't be delinquent. However, interest will accrue. So your balance might go up. Payments are still due. If you can make them, great, especially if you're pursuing PSLF in order to reach that 120 payments. Um, the caveat is the Department of Ed can't control how credit scoring companies might factor missed or delayed payments. So to protect yourself, um, check your, your credit score frequently. Your banking apps are great about showing credit scores, as well as check your credit report just to keep an eye on it if you aren't able to make payments. All right, next slide. Yeah, Erin, a question that just came in is, can you apply for SAVE as a student or must you already have income and be graduated? Well, it depends. Um, so if you are a student and enrolled half time, you can qualify for in-school deferment, which is that kind of like that grace period where you're not uh, responsible for paying. Um, I would talk with your loan servicer first about that question um, and see what your options are for repayment if you're interested in starting repayment. All right, I'll keep going and um, to keep us on time about a minute. Yes, yes. Um, so if you are in loan default, there is the Fresh Start program. Um, this is the one-time temporary program from the U.S. Department of Education, and it is a benefit to borrowers who are in default. So you have to be proactive and take the steps to enroll and it's free and the QR code will take you to the page that has the steps um, to get that started. It takes less than 10 minutes to get enrolled. And then I'm gonna hand this over to Mike to talk a little bit about if you're in bankruptcy and options. Yeah, I mean, uh, so bankruptcy is just one of those things that's that's kind of a hot topic item as it relates to student loans in general. And and when it comes to federal student loans, there are, uh, well, really all student loans, there are limitations as it relates to um, whether or not you can discharge your loans in bankruptcy. And we just wanted to highlight a few things um, for, uh, for consumers, especially since there have been some changes, um, at least guidance from the Department of Justice recently uh, on, on direct loans um, that uh, makes it a little more streamlined. But in order for you to have your loans discharged in bankruptcy, there you have to file a separate action in that bankruptcy. It's called an adversary proceeding uh, and have to prove that there would be undue hardship that would occur if your loans are not discharged. Like I mentioned, there's recent guidance at the end of last year from the Department of Justice that 
Uh, they've created an attestation form to make things a little bit more streamlined. It's not easy. It's still like a 15 page, but it's a lot of, of, of paperwork that needs to be completed. Um, it's only applicable to direct loans and loans that are held by the Department of Education. So private loans and, and old uh, federal family education loans um, would still have the undue hardship um, requirements that are um, <clears throat> a little more challenging. Um, did want to point out a little you know, self-promotion on the part of a said. We have recently, uh, you know, heard the industry on this and and have kind of forged a, a, a market leading um, uh, process that that for loans that are uh, originated after June fifth of this year, um, you don't have to demonstrate that undue hardship if you meet certain conditions. You can go to our website and look at our FAQs for uh, borrowers if you if you've taken out a loan to understand what those requirements are. Um, but but we just understand that that this is a uh, an item that. Um, perhaps isn't the most fair um, component of, of, of student lending. And even though the department has made some changes, um, it's still it's still pretty challenging in the space. All right, another key piece is just being aware of scams. This is a really hot topic. People are gonna take advantage. Um, so just never give out your FSA ID. If you do get a phone call, from someone saying it's your loan servicer, politely hang up and call your loan servicer to see if they try contacting you. And then federal student aid is really your trusted source. It's free. You should not have to pay for help um, with repayment. And then here, we just wanted to list some of the email addresses and text numbers that are legit, that are coming from federal student aid. All right, many of you have questions. I was able to answer a lot of the, the same questions you have by going through these steps, um, especially around how do I lower repayment? How do I lower my payments? What are my options? How do I find out my servicer? So again, takeaways from today, if you, if you haven't gone through these steps or just some of them, definitely start with studentaid.gov. Once you log in, if you did forget your FSA ID, it, it, there's a there's a forgot username and password option. Um, so you can navigate that. And then um, once you get into your dashboard, it'll have the link to your loan servicer, which will show you your amount of your monthly payment. If it is too high, if you wanna look at your options, definitely use the loan simulator. This is on the menu in studentaid.gov. The loan simulator is going to show you different options just by punching in some of your information. Um, income, dependents, um, do you have an H uh, HSA account? There's a couple different questions they ask. And the, once you go through the simulator, all your different repayment options will surface and you can compare them, uh, which is a really cool feature and it breaks it down. Um, and then last part, if you are really having challenges, hardships with payments, as many people are, explore SAVE and the on-ramp program. And I think that concludes. Yeah, so our presentation. Uh, it's 730 for me here in Central Time on the dot. So if you need to hop, please do. Please know that this is recorded. We will be emailing the recording out um, and then also have a ton of resources here on this QR code on our website. Um, and we'll be addressing a lot of these questions in upcoming events, in upcoming blog posts, in upcoming newsletters. So please make sure that you are staying up to date with everything on our website and on our social media platforms. There's one question that's come up in the Q&A a bunch. So if you have two minutes to stick around, I'm going to let Mike answer this and then we'll wrap things up. So a lot of questions, Mike, around payment of interest versus principal and when to pay back each and uh, how all of that works. So Mike, if you can just spend a couple of minutes answering that, that'd be super helpful to our audience. Sure thing. I mean, so, I mean, in, in, in general, like when you borrow a loan at the outset, really all you have is the principal, right? That's the amount that you, that you borrow. Right. And, and then the interest that's charged is a, it's a percentage of that outstanding amount of principal. Um, and so um, when you make payments on, we'll, we'll say federal loans is, as the example here, uh, your payments are are going to go to the, that interest, it'll go to fees first if you have any, then it'll go to interest and then it'll go to principal. Um, if, you, uh, if you want to pay extra uh, in addition to the outstanding principal or interest that you owe, then that would go towards principal. And if you reduce your principal, then 
the uh, percentage that you'd have to pay for interest is based on a lower dollar amount, right? So, so really, uh, any chance that you have where you can um, pay down your principal, you should try to take advantage of doing that because it's ultimately going to cost you less. Just know that any payments you make are always going to go to outstanding interest first. So it's a super confusing concept. When I talked earlier about um, accrued interest, uh, think of it this way. Like if you defer your student loan, if you take out $10,000 uh, and you have an interest rate of you know 5% uh, and you have to pay $500 a year, basically an interest that, 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 uh, that accrues on that loan if you're not making payments, then after two years, you'll have $1,000 of interest that's accrued that gets added to that principal of that loan. And now you owe $11,000 and the interest is going to be based on that, that amount. Um, if you have an interest that's been accruing over time and you make payments against the loan, that those payments are going to go against that accrued interest balance that's, that's adding up. So while you're in school, if you can make payments on, on your loan, it's super advantageous for you to do that if you have an unsubsidized loan with the government, um, because ultimately it's going to reduce the total cost of your loan um, when you ultimately pay it off over time because the balance is going to be less. Great. I think that really addressed a lot of the questions that uh, popped up in the Q&A in the chat. Um, again, thank you all so much for joining thank us you. tonight. Uh, it's been a great conversation. We've got the chat questions. We've got the Q&A questions. I know, unfortunately, we weren't able to address as many of them as we had hoped, but please stay tuned on future resources coming from the Ascent team in the coming weeks as we all navigate this change and this repayment together. Thank you. Thank you.